In this dangerous world, what does it take to win? Across the savannah, deep in the forest, or under the sea, every victor has something in common, the right tools for the job. Whether it's vision, speed, sense of touch, or smell, exceptional equipment ups the odds. In the battle for survival, a soldier is only as good as her gear. And when it comes to state of the art, these are the special forces. Tropical jungles cover only 6% of the world's surface, but are home to millions of animal species. And for each one, every day is a battle for survival. Off the southeast coast of Africa, on the island of Madagascar, dwells an animal uniquely geared up for action. A stealthy, solitary soldier, the chameleon. Its special gear boasts one especially eye-catching feature, its eyes. Through them, the chameleon can view an almost 360-degree panorama, keeping him safe and aiding the hunt. These highly evolved gun sights can zero in on targets one kilometer away. They can rotate independently and focus precisely on a target four times faster than we can. This precision gear is positioned on opposite sides of his head, providing a view to the sides, behind, and toward the front. To protect his sensitive surveillance gear, the chameleon has evolved a thick, muscular eyelid. It surrounds each eye turret, leaving only the pupil exposed and sharpening its acuity. Because the eyes aren't blocked by deep eye sockets, each eye is free to rotate like a periscope, independently of each other. But when the chameleon spots potential prey, this special forces spy focuses his gear in the same direction gaining stereoscopic vision for precise distance and depth perception. While searching for prey, monocular vision is good enough. Each eye is controlled by separate nerve bundles to provide a wide sweep of his surroundings. Once the surveillance expert spots his prey, the images synchronize or couple. The eye that finds the target sends stronger impulses to the brain than the eye still searching. Then both lock on, creating a stereoscopic image so he can accurately deploy his other special gear, his tongue. The anatomy of the chameleon's eye gives this lizard telephoto vision. It also has the highest density of optical cells of any animal tested, so it sees in high definition. His precision optical gear is even more enhanced by the protective turret. Behind those sharp eyes is a remarkable brain to process all that visual data. By shifting his focus, this Special Forces sharpshooter can accurately estimate distance, even with a single eye. When both eyes lock on a target, it's game over, as the chameleon deploys its ballistic tongue at almost 100 kilometers per hour. After a successful mission, this Special Forces soldier takes a rest but must remain vigilant. Danger can come literally from anywhere. Once his gear reveals an attacker, he knows now's the time to stay hidden. The only blind spot measuring 18 degrees resides directly above his head.
While it's said that chameleons change color to mimic their environment, that's not really true. Color-changing cells are a vital part of a chameleon's gear, but not in the way you might think. They sometimes use color to stand out like battle flags, as this female Laborde's chameleon is doing. A male has tracked her, eager to accomplish his ultimate mission in life, mating. Though in his excitement he's disobeyed his orders, her colors clearly signal that she's really not in the mood. So they engage, though not in the way he intended. Losing this battle should teach him how to tell allies from enemies, respect the uniform. He's lost the battle, but not the war. He'll devote his optical gear to finding a more suitably colored, receptive female. Heading onto the African mainland, we find a completely different Special Forces environment. The lush and tangled jungles retreat, leaving the open battlefield of the savanna. Here, on most of Africa's grasslands, lives a surveillance and ambush specialist, the most effective feline hunter. The serval. Weighing only about 16 kilos, one might think the serval is not so formidable. But thanks to his special gear, his kill ratio is as high as 62%, way more lethal than any big, scarier cat could ever dream of. He stays hidden in the tall grass, safe from competition, while searching for rodents and small animals. And this warrior can get just as ferocious as his bigger cousins. Servals owe their ninja-like success to their precise hearing, channeled through the largest ears compared to body size of any cat. This rotating radar gear amplifies sounds. The bigger the ears, the more sound they can channel into the middle and inner ear, increasing the serval's ability to pinpoint prey, which is mostly mice. All cats have 32 muscles within each ear, which allows the cat to rotate each ear independently, 180 degrees, to focus on the source of the sound. The serval's huge ears are tuned to the ultrasonic frequencies of their squeaking prey, and possibly even to their movement underground. Servals can effectively intercept this communication from as far as 15 meters. Once his gear picks up the signal, the Special Forces feline locks on, patiently focusing on the precise location of his prey without tipping it off. He keeps perfectly still until the mouse gets near, then pounces. Skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the cat stuns his prey with a blow from his forepaws. Then the soldier finishes the job with a bite to the neck. Mission accomplished. The serval takes cover to avoid bigger competitors.
Being such natural born killers, servals thrive on the savannah. Their oversized ears are only part of their special gear. They also have the longest legs of any cat relative to body size. And he knows how to deploy those big guns. His ears lead him to the underground sound of a mole rat. Although he stands only about 62 centimeters at the shoulder, his legs allow him to jump up to two meters high. This one didn't challenge himself today. A mole rat is an easy target. Besides special gear, servals use special tactics. Unlike most cats, they'll dig up a part of the rat's tunnel and patiently wait for the rodent to start repairs. The hunter listens patiently for the prey to reach striking distance for an easy kill. From the tips of his large ears to the ends of his long legs, the serval is geared up to be a special forces sniper. On the African savanna, hearing pays off to the servals. Their radar dish ears are remarkable. In water, though, large ears aren't an advantage. Survival below the surface demands other special gear. Near the coast of Australia, in the Shark Bay, lives our next member of the Special Forces, one whose entire body is a sort of radar antenna. A peaceful grazer, the dugong. These mammalian mini submarines, also known as sea cows, are strict herbivores. At a leisurely pace of about 10 kilometers per hour, they dive to the bottom in search of seagrass. Special forces have elite tastes, and they graze only certain meadows. Some will dive as deep as 37 meters for their favorite grasses. Their hearing is not as keen as the servals, and their eyesight is far worse. But they have developed other sensory gear to perceive their surroundings. Touch. These submariners feel their surroundings. On their mouth, long, sensitive whiskers, or vibrasi, help them find food. Short hairs all over their bodies provide complex information about their surroundings. On their grazing mission, they can eat up to 40 kilograms of seagrass per day. As they feel around for their food, they get a sense of how much is available. They devour grasses, roots and all. If the grass is scarce, they'll eat algae. Their large, rounded snout ends in a muscular cleft. It hangs over the downturned mouth and helps the dugong keep contact with the sea bottom as it pulls up roots. Six types of sensory bristles cover their lips and help them locate food. As the bristles around their mouths find the sought-after grasses, their muscular snouts get busy pulling it up, leaving furrows in the sand as they graze. A dugong depends on six bristle fields for grazing. Two of the bristle fields are in its lower jaw and four poke out of its upper jaw. 
But to gather intelligence about its entire surroundings, its left and right sides are each outfitted with 1,500 tactile hairs. These hairs range from two to nine millimeters in length, and they transmit delicate sensory information to the brain. This tactile minefield conveys information about other animals near them, friend or foe. including other members of their special forces fleet. That's essential for this little one who has to keep close to his mother for protection. It also helps him avoid obstacles and senses water currents. This tactile gear is thought to be the most developed of any mammal. This one is too young to take care of himself. So he uses his sense of touch to feel the currents and stay close to his mother. These social special forces stick together, sometimes in groups of up to 200 if the seagrass is plentiful. If not, they'll migrate far in search of greener pastures using their sensitive bristle gear to get a sense of where they are. Though they may cover a lot of ground, they move rather slowly as the only fully marine mammal that exclusively eats plants, their metabolism is more freighter than fighter. Peaceful dugongs don't deploy their special forces into the deepest regions of the open sea. They leave that mission to some of the ocean's biggest battle-ready frigates. Far from the coast, these leviathans tend to keep fleet formations of up to 20 vessels. They are geared up to perform maneuvers in all waters except the polar seas. This pod patrols the Atlantic between Africa and South America. Sperm whales. Ten of these giants in a row would match the size of an Ohio-class submarine, and in their own way, they could be just as powerful. They are the largest tooth predators on our planet and have the largest brain of any animal, five times heavier than ours, and their heads are filled with other amazing gear. The sperm whale is equipped with state-of-the-art communications gear. It can produce sounds of up to 230 decibels, far louder than a jet engine. The sounds keep the pot organized and might work as a sonic weapon during hunting. They owe their formidable vocal and hearing abilities to organs filled with a mixture of liquid fats and waxes called spermaceti. The dense fluid amplifies the sounds the whales depend on for echolocation and communication. Communication starts with a series of clicks generated through special gear, a pair of phonic lips. Each whale has his own signature clicks so that everybody in the fleet can keep track of his comrades' moves. 
Sound travels through a sperm whale's dense spermaceti nearly twice as fast as it does through the oil of a dolphin's skull, and almost 1,800 times faster than the speed of sound through salt water. The sperm whale's fluid-filled spermaceti organ acts like a megaphone, enhancing the power of sound waves. When the whale produces a click just below the blowhole, the sound travels to the back of the spermaceti and reverberates several times in a matter of milliseconds. The whale's sound receiving gear starts with its lower jaw, which picks up echoes. A continuous fat-filled canal transmits those sounds to the inner ear. These special forces sperm whales might even use sound for hunting. They usually dive between 300 and 800 meters and can stay submerged for more than an hour as they search for octopus, rays, and various squids. But to catch the elusive giant squid, they might dive as deep as two kilometers. lock onto their target using echolocation and might even stun it with a sonic blast, the most powerful sound in the animal kingdom. But this system has risks. The sperm whale's echolocation gear can backfire when they get near a coast. If one whale gets stranded in the shallow water, his distress calls might summon the troops, stranding his comrades as well. In some places, between 50 and 70 sperm whales have been stranded at the same time, victims of their close bonds and their sensitive gear. Which is why they have to be cautious and try to confine their incredible vocal abilities to the open seas. Pods of sperm whales use their sonic gear to troll the ocean deep. In the deep woods of the Northern Hemisphere lurk solitary special forces well equipped for their survival mission. Across the cold regions of Asia, Europe, and North America are the theaters of war for a particularly feisty breed of soldier. Wolverine. Looking like a small bear and possibly even more ferocious, these solitary mammals belong to the weasel family. Only about knee high to a man, wolverines can take down adult deer, though mostly they fulfill their mission as scavengers, especially in winter and early spring. A wolverine's feeding mission might take her 25 kilometers in a day. She relies on special gear to find rations to fill her belly.
Wolverines can smell prey six meters under the snow. They will excavate burrows and kill hibernating animals. Trekking through the ice and snow burns a lot of energy. This soldier's sensitive nasal gear allows her to sniff out prey as efficiently as possible without wasting a step. Whether her target is buried deep in the snow or laying far across the woods, she'll find it. That enables her to successfully complete her survival mission even when prey is scarce. A wolverine can detect smells from farther than three kilometers away thanks to the honeycomb-shaped structure in its nasal cavity. The organ picks up scent molecules in the air and its shape maximizes its surface area. Unraveled, it would be almost the size of a dinner plate. This tracker has found a deer carcass. She'll gorge herself now, and then apply her special forces survival training tactics, which rely on her keen sense of smell. She'll bury the remains of the carcass for later, using the snow and ice as a natural refrigerator. Wolverines stash food this way throughout their territory so they can sniff it out when times get tough. Storage on ice reduces the chances of other animals finding their cache. Their strong jaws and teeth have no trouble gnawing through frozen flesh and bone. The wolverine's specialized nasal gear has 30 times the surface area of a human's. That's something like the difference between a postage stamp and a large postcard. Their sensitive olfactory gear enables these special forces to harness nature's destructive power to their advantage. For these soldiers of misfortune, even an avalanche provides an opportunity as it buries everything in its path. Afterward, this wolverine is one of the first responders, hungrily sniffing out and digging up a reindeer carcass before anyone else gets it. With her belly full and her treasure reburied for later, she returns to headquarters in her den. The Wolverine's special gear makes her the master of her frozen world. But on the other side of the planet, the rules of engagement are entirely different, and so is the gear. Instead of a desolate, snowy landscape, we have a warm, tropical sea brimming with life and battles for survival. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is home to over 300 species of mollusks, and one group stands out for its unique anatomy and enhanced sensory gear. The octopus. These universal soldiers are fully equipped for any situation from hunting to hiding.
These shape-shifting special forces wage guerrilla warfare on shrimp, crabs, and even lobsters. Equipped with eight arms, three hearts, and not a bone in its body, he's arguably one of the planet's most unusual-looking warriors, but his strategy depends on seeing while not being seen. An octopus sees in 360 degrees, giving them a perfect overview of their surroundings. What they cannot see, they can sense by touch and even taste through the entire surface of their bodies. Despite their military-grade camouflage skills, most octopus are colorblind. Their optical gear is calibrated to read polarized light, which helps them hunt shimmering fish. The anatomy of octopus eyes is very similar to human eyes, as opposed to eyes of fish. But unlike ours, the eye of an octopus has no blind spot. This gives the octopus enough time to avoid danger, waiting in his bunker until the enemy leaves the battlefield. This shark has no luck today. His mission's been foiled by the sensitive early detection system of the octopus. Good vision is only part of the special gear for the octopus. He's the original armed forces. Those eight flexible arms are outfitted with hundreds of suckers that help him move and grab things. More than suction cups, the discs can even cling tightly to rough surfaces. The octopus senses his environment with his entire body. The eight arms carry an estimated 240 million receptors, which gather tactile and chemical information. Each three millimeter sucker is lined with tens of thousands of mechanical and chemical receptors in a single layer of cells. They can even taste things with their suckers. Being fully armed with sensory cells means that the octopus doesn't even have to see its prey. This red octopus simply reaches into a crevice in search of an easy meal. The Special Forces chemoreceptor gear helps the octopus navigate through her environment. She can detect slight changes in the water to find her bearings and detect prey. For simpler tastes like sweet, salty, and bitter, the receptors on octopus suckers might be 100 times more sensitive than our own taste buds. This blue-ringed octopus locked onto her target. Guided by chemoreceptors, she has the enemy within striking range. In true assassin fashion, the octopus snatches her meal, a perfect catch made by a perfectly geared marine predator. The specialized gear of the octopus makes her a strange and powerful force in her exotic world. An ocean away, a more recognizable troop of special forces practices maneuvers. In Africa, groups of amazing primates live and hunt and prosper thanks to a truly gripping piece of gear. Meet the Savannah's special forces. Baboons. These tight-knit troops of up to 120 members keep in touch on many fronts. 
Even the youngest recruits instinctively master the special gear that sets primates apart, hands that grip. Not only do baboons have agile fingers, but also a fine sense of touch. They can perform delicate field operations almost as well as we can. Thanks to an intricate distribution of nerves and an important anatomical feature, the baboon's signature maneuver is what's called a precision grip. They engage the precision grip by pressing the thumb against the other fingers. Whenever you pick up a pen or catch a ball, you're using a precision grip. Baboon troops in the field rely on their precision grip for other duties. Baboons operate in a potential battlefield. Most of their neighbors are armed with sharp claws, so these little ones, the smallest of the baboon special forces, stay under their mother's guard. Their grip enables their mother to become a troop transport. The young ones just have to hang on tight to stay safe. A precision grip is also essential for creating camaraderie among the troops. In the form of social grooming, by carefully removing ticks and other parasites from each other, the baboons increase social bonds and reduce stress. Removing a tick only a few milliliters across demands more than just a good grip. It also requires a refined sense of touch. Besides their opposable thumbs, baboons have four main nerve groups in different layers of skin. Pacinian corpuscles respond to pressure and vibrations. Meissner's corpuscles detect low-frequency vibrations. Ruffini's endings are sensitive to stretch, and Merkel's discs respond to gentle touch and perceived shapes. Through this special gear, baboons can better experience and manipulate their world. But picking parasites is one thing. Grabbing a bite to eat is another. Time to infiltrate a fleet of flamingos. The trick is to move slowly and not arouse suspicion while behind enemy lines. When he finds a target in range, he strikes. With his strong grip, he grabs the flamingo, holding it so it can't fly away. A bite to the neck finishes the job. The baboon takes his trophy of war up to the riverbank. Only baboons and other higher primate special forces have the manual gear to take down prey with their bare hands, and that includes humans. This baboon's tactile skills have earned him a good dinner. He might not be able to use a knife and fork, but his dexterity allows him to pull off the best pieces of flamingo meat. A baboon's sense of touch is essential gear, but primates aren't the only special forces that depend on touch. We head now to Australia, where jungle warfare plays out every day. Mm -hmm. 
The forests of Queensland hide countless quiet battlefields, many of them lined with silk. These are the theaters of war for thousands of species of spiders. Spider silk might be the most specialized special gear in the animal world. Eight different kinds, depending on the spider, woven on demand for a variety of purposes. It's a home building material. A line for repelling to safety. A telegraph for communicating with a mate. A cocoon for raising offspring. All spiders spin silk, but not all build webs. Web-dwelling spiders don't see well. These special forces gather intel by reading the vibrations on their webs. Different frequencies distinguish between friend and food. This female St. Andrew's Cross web spider precisely engineers her snare. She employs a strategy that has served her kind well for millions of years. Once she finishes her trap, all she must do is wait. Staying perfectly still, she reads the slight vibrations like a secret code from every corner of her web. Her special gear is on her feet, structures that are specially attuned to decrypt various kinds of vibrations. There it is, the web transmits a signal. A smaller spider has wandered into her trap. He's unaware that he's tripped a landmine. A spider's feet are special gear. They never get stuck on their own web. She can move swiftly across the sticky strands and attack in a split second. After the cross spider immobilizes her prey with a bite, she wraps it with another type of silk to hold him until it's time to eat. As a spider plucks the web, it sends out ripples in every direction. Three different kinds of sensors on its legs read the vibrations, so the spider can check the web's integrity. She can tell if the web is damaged or if she might have a visitor. If it's a visitor, she can tell if it's potential prey or a potential suitor. This funnel web spider doesn't build a web like the cross spider. He lines his den with individual strands that alert him to intruders at the entrance of his den. He's picked up the vibration of prey, a cricket. This special forces spider is among the most venomous in the world, even to humans. Among his special gear, a pincher that can supposedly pierce a person's toenail. That was a fine catch. Now, this male spider is on a different mission. infiltrating a female's web, looking to mate. Approaching carefully, he does not want to endanger the treaty. By the nature of the vibrations, the female knows that he's not an enemy or prey. But apparently, she's not in the mood. Despite all the sensory advantages, the male is forced to retreat. Sometimes it takes more than special gear to fulfill a diplomatic mission.
In this world, the competition never quits. Having the right gear provides more than a fighting chance for success. For optical gear, the chameleon is the champ. With his super keen vision and independently moving eyes, nothing gets past him. As long as he's patient, his battle plan can't fail. The serval isn't much different. Instead of gun turret eyes, she relies on her rotating radar dish ears, picking up sounds that others might miss. And she also gets rewarded for her patience. While the chameleon and serval tune their gear to distant signals, the dagong gathers intelligence from close proximity. The whiskers on its face and body work like thousands of tiny antennae to find food and fellow submariners in the rippling water. The water also carries a secret code for the sperm whale, who uses clicks and sonar to rally the troops and find food. His head is like an enormous sonic transmitter receiver. The sperm whale relies on sound, while the wolverine depends on smell. Her nasal gear picks up odor molecules even several meters under the snow, thanks to her specialized navel cavity, which maximizes surface area. The octopus may carry the most sophisticated gear of all. Besides its polarized vision, its whole body is an array of sensors for taste and touch. It's like an eight-armed chemistry field lab. Baboons don't need eight arms when two opposable thumbs will do. The baboon's precision grip is both a tool and a weapon. And this gear is enhanced by sensitive nerves for ultimate control. Spiders are ultra-sensitive too, but their gear is in their legs. In their silken webs, they're attuned to the slightest vibration of friends and foes. These soldiers are on the front lines of the battle for survival. Special forces with special gear and prepared to win. Within this natural world lie countless hidden worlds. Worlds experienced through sensations, vibrations, and colors that not everyone can detect. Every animal perceives the world in its own way, and survival depends on reading the signs or relaying the signals. In every environment, nature has provided specialists, and among them are the Special Forces. We begin our discovery of the amazing Special Forces by inspecting a sleek, limber, and well-equipped fleet. They patrol the waters off the Australian coast. Bottlenose dolphins. These four meter long submariners perform their maneuvers in relatively shallow waters, usually in pods of five to 20. Sometimes these mini fleets embark on hunting operations in river estuaries, but in these murky waters, it's difficult to see and get oriented. Which is why these specialists don't trust their eyes, but strongly rely on their hearing. Dolphins are known for their sophisticated communication techniques. When hunting, they use their vocal and hearing skills to perform echolocation. 
A dolphin does not have vocal cords. This communication specialist produces sounds by moving air through its nasal passages. Dolphins don't have a language, but they do have a wide vocabulary of whistles, trills, clicks, squeaks, and creaks. Each sound, pattern, and frequency carries a different meaning. Bottlenose dolphins can hear sounds almost as deep as we can, but in a high range, they can hear much better than cats or dogs, well beyond our own ability. In most social communication, they use their lower range, but it's still much higher than we can hear. Each dolphin identifies itself with a signature whistle that lasts less than one second. That whistle is within our hearing range. A mother dolphin can whistle to her calf almost continuously for several days after giving birth. This acoustic imprinting helps the cadet learn to identify his commanding officer, his mother. In about a month, he'll develop his own ID call. Having learned the pod's call signs, the cadet joins some of his crew members on a hunting expedition in the deeper sea. Communication helps the team coordinate their efforts to round up the maximum amount of fish with the least amount of effort. First, they must locate the best fishing spots. That's where echolocation comes in. The dolphins emit an ultrasonic ping underwater, which travels about four and a half times faster than it travels through air. Like sonar, the sound bounces off the prey and echoes back to the dolphin. Echolocation can pinpoint a fish the size of a pack of gum from about 200 meters away. Like most echolocation specialists, dolphins pick up the sound in their lower jawbone. In Florida, bottlenose dolphins may increase their hunting success by venturing into river estuaries where the salt and freshwater mix. Like sailors in a fog, they couldn't navigate the murky water here without echolocation. Communication and teamwork win the day. Three or more dolphins coordinated strikes herd the slippery fish onto the shore where they can't escape. Once they've captured the enemy in the mud, the special forces storm the beach, eat the fish, and get back to the water. Such is the power of the bottlenose dolphin, a communication specialist that uses its skills to rally the troops for its well-coordinated search and destroy missions. From the formidable team players in the seas, we go to another social and highly coordinated specialist. But this one has mastered the sky. The European countryside is one of the summer home bases and training grounds for a daring squadron of tiny pilots.
Controlling the skies and returning to the airfield is a barn swallow. These avian airmen are specialists when it comes to establishing beach heads and new bases. Whole squadrons of these small pilots crisscross thousands of kilometers twice a year in their migration. To navigate on their 11,000 kilometer mission across the equator and back again, they rely on the Earth's magnetic field. They make camp in Europe only during warm months when the insects are plentiful. As their name suggests, barn swallows usually construct their hangars in human buildings. Old barns are an ideal place to hatch the new recruits. Their mother provides for them in the nest for about 20 days, and even when they fledge, they keep returning to this mess hall for about a week. Barn swallows return to the same nest area, sometimes for generations. Like a homing beacon, the magnetic fingerprint of their base is imprinted on them so they know precisely where to go. When autumn comes, the squadron decamps. These European swallows usually migrate to southern Africa. These winter grounds are home to about two million of them. Swallows feed here and wait out the winter. They need to regain their strength for the treacherous return to Europe. But they won't get too comfortable. They're a mobile unit, and once the snow melts in their European air station, they'll need to return and breed. To navigate, barn swallows can observe the Earth's magnetic field lines. They probably see the lines as dark spots. When they head north in spring, they see the magnetic lines above the horizon. In autumn, when migrating toward the equator, the lines appear below the horizon. Their compass information changes even when moving east or westward because they're able to perceive the angle or the inclination of the magnetic field. These swallows are called back home from their winter base in Nigeria. They may have to travel around 5,000 kilometers to get there. And between them and home lies one of the planet's biggest death traps, one that cannot be conquered. The nine million square kilometers Sahara Desert. Too wide to go around with temperatures reaching a blistering 59 degrees Celsius. These swallows have traveled 2,500 kilometers since they started their journey. They need to refuel to continue. Thanks to their built-in compass, they know just where to go. Umama Oasis. The swallows are safe. Now the squadron will be able to continue using their specialist navigation system to safely return to their summer base. Leaving the migrating squadron of sparrows to their aerial maneuvers, we cross an ocean to inspect some heavy forces on land, specialists in clandestine communication. 
These special forces send messages with the highest level of encryption. One of Africa's most recognizable ambassadors lives only in certain parts of the continent, and more rarely in parts of Asia. Built like tanks, but conducting their peaceful mission on the grasses here are the rhinos. These white rhinos form a unit of up to a dozen soldiers. Like all command posts, communication is the key to keeping order. Letting the troops know who is the captain. Training the new cadets. And moving up the chain of command. All six species of rhino encode their messages to utilize their great sense of smell and hearing. These specialists are among the few land animals that can transmit their classified reports in frequencies way below the threshold of human hearing using infrasound. The benefit of infrasound is that the lower frequency sounds travel farther than higher frequency sounds. The infrasound waves aren't as easily disrupted by hills and trees. And that means this male's getting the message he's been waiting for. The usually solitary adults fraternize only when they're on a diplomatic mission to mate. Females leave behind their usual scent to mark their presence. When it's time to reproduce, they use infrasound signaling to advertise their readiness. Rhinos have poor vision, so they show no outward visual signs that they're in heat. Once these special forces meet, the female will follow her chosen male, warning off other females by leaving scent marks. Then the pair follow the usual protocol to conduct their liaison. African rhinos have fulfilled their mission. But the true masters of infrasonic communication are their special forces counterparts stationed in the dense jungles of Asia. There are fewer than 100 Sumatran rhinos, Disumotrus sumatrensis, left in the world. These specialists are the most solitary rhinos, very territorial with vast ranges, about 50 square kilometers for males and 15 for females. So their infrasonic signal has to travel enormous distances through many obstacles. Sumatran rhinos can produce 90 decibel whistles, about as loud as a nearby train whistle, but because the sound is in the infrasonic range, we can't hear it. Even so, the whistle, followed by a sharp burst of air, can carry for almost 20 kilometers across the forest to reach the ears of other rhinos. These two have found each other. The specialized infrasonic signaling has worked. Now they debrief each other, agree to the terms of their treaty, and complete their crucial mission. About a year later, the strategic alliance of these soldiers pays off. 
In the night, the mother gives birth to her calf. It's a momentous occasion. Sumatran rhinos have a single baby only every two to five years. Despite their great sensory equipment for romantic reconnaissance, Sumatran rhinos are dying out for lack of reproduction. The new recruit will stay in boot camp with her mother for more than two years, and it will take even longer before she joins the special forces, using her infrasonic abilities to become a parent herself. Sumatran rhinos are peaceful herbivores, specialists in long-range communication to locate each other over great distances. Our next specialists are more interested in finding prey, and their method is both very sophisticated and extremely ancient. In the waters near the African coast, along the sandy bottom, lives a special forces tracker skilled in locking onto his target. Hiding and waiting like a sniper, the stingray. With eyes on the top of her head and no way to see below, how does she hunt? Her eyes aren't important when she's equipped with specialized sensors called ampullae of Lorenzini that can detect the minute electrical charges of her potential prey. She shares this skill with her relative, the shark. They've developed this specialized sensory apparatus about 15 million years ago. And this one is about to begin her feeding mission. These small squids would make a perfect meal. But the ray is into something else, something easier to catch. Their eggs. Like a minesweeper, all she has to do is brush the surface, and there they are. She zeroes in on the tiny electrical impulses they, like all living things, emit. The underside of a stingray's body is pocked with hundreds of thousands of tiny pores, called ampullae of Lorenzini. They connect to a long jelly-filled canal which contains a bundle of sensory cells. The ampullae allow rays to detect weak electrical fields emitted by muscle movements of their prey, even if they're hidden. The ampullae can also detect motion. The ray doesn't care if it stirs up the sand because it doesn't use its eyes to hunt. In the waters off Australia, a stingray has perfectly timed his raid on a busy outpost. Spider crabs are usually solitary, except when it's time to molt their shells. Vulnerable, they gather in huge numbers, which makes them an easy target. The 
Though the Ray has superior weaponry, he needs a strategy. He looks for the freshest molts with the softest armor. For this specialist, guided by electricity, that's no problem. The new soft shell releases slightly stronger electrical impulses. For the crab, there's nowhere to hide. sweeps the bottom until its receptors lock on for his search and destroy mission. Electro reception is this soldier's secret weapon. Electro reception works great for Marines like the Stingray, where the water is conductive, but special forces living in one of the driest climates on Earth need to develop different survival tactics. The edge of Africa's Namib Desert is a home to a well-trained regiment of trackers that works best when working together. Duties are divided, and the sentries always on guard to protect the compound of meerkats. These small members of the mongoose family bet on numbers. An average clan can have about 20. While a few specialists keep a sharp eye out for predators, the rest busy themselves with foraging duties. Like an air raid siren, a sharp shrill can warn all personnel to take cover and disappear within their complex burrow system. Meerkats are specialists with sharp vision and superb sense of smell. Those are what it takes to survive when you're stationed in a desert or semi-desert environment. Meerkats spend much of their time digging with their noses near the ground. They can smell prey hiding below the surface. Their sensitive olfactory equipment can even discern between favorites, familiar foods, and ones they're not familiar with. Victory! This soldier has flushed out a scorpion. The meerkat is immune to its venom, so he can eat it without a second thought. A meerkat clan's territory could span 10 square kilometers, and the troops guard it fiercely against enemy forces, including other meerkats. An invasion team approaches. The meerkats rely on their sense of smell to tell allies from enemies. Once they identify their adversaries, the clan works together to drive them out. Friends and foe alike may be silent or well camouflaged, but they can never hide their scent, which is why the meerkat's special forces rely on their noses. This cobra might think she secretly infiltrated the meerkat's defenses. Not on his watch, he sounds the alert. The military patrol instantly surrounds the invader, ruining the element of surprise she depends on. She aborts her mission. But 
One of the colony's biggest threats comes without a scent and without a sound. So these specialists rely on their sharp vision as an early warning defense against threats from land or air. The dark patches around their eyes serve as natural sunglasses, essential in this sunlit environment. A meerkat sentry can spot danger or prey from as far as one kilometer. Like actual cats, meerkats have forward-facing eyes for depth perception. Horizontal pupils also improve their depth perception and their horizontal field of view. Their large eyes and eye sockets take up more than 20% of their skull length. This specialized vision gives the foraging troops enough time to retreat in case of attack. The special forces are put to the test, retreating to their burrow with no casualties. Staying small and limber and working as a highly trained unit enables these specialists to prevail over their predators. Which is why the meerkats thrive as one of the Namib Desert's special forces. On the other side of the world, in colder terrain, another unit of mighty specialists also demands a high level of coordination and leadership to succeed. In the woods of North America live iconic predators, able to take down targets way bigger than themselves. Gray wolves. These survival specialists live in packs. An alpha pair of wolves leads each pack. They demand strict social order, which they enforce through constant communication. The pack maintains discipline by barking, growling, and howling, which reduce the need for open conflict. Vocal communication also works at a distance. So wolves are specialists at making sounds and listening. They call any time of day, but they're most active and vocal in the evening. When the wind is still, a wolf can heed a call through the forest from 10 kilometers away or 16 kilometers in the open. As impressive as that might be, a pack of wolves may range over a territory up to 2,500 square kilometers, depending on the availability of their prey. <laughs> And what hearing and body language can't do, scent can. Wolves mark their territory with scats and urine to make a lasting impression on the area for anyone coming later. The scent lingers long after the howling fades. They can discern allies from enemies by the scent of the urine. This battle diary lets them know if the other wolves pass through this territory. 
if they were male or female, and how recently they visited. A wolf marks its territory with his scent print around every 100 meters. Specialized glands around the anus and near the base of its tail produce his signature scent. A wolf's specialized sense of smell is 100,000 times more sensitive than ours. They exhale through side slits in their nostrils so the incoming scent doesn't get diluted. Their olfactory bulb, which recognizes smells, is three times larger than in humans. When the mission calls for finding food, scent is crucial. The wolves sniff out a bison herd on the edge of their forest. They can detect their prey from almost three kilometers. Now they must target a single calf. The chase begins. Working together, the wolves herd the buffaloes. They come from all sides, trying to separate the little one from the rest. With their specialized sense of smell, some wolves don't need to see their prey. They can track it by scent until the very end. Such is the power of a wolf pack's incredible sensory talents and their tactical methods of communication that brings them success on the battlefield. Wolves succeed because of their pack mentality. The group is always stronger than the individual. Nowhere is this more true than with our next Special Forces Specialists. Their dedication to a common goal is among the strongest in the animal kingdom. From the moment they're born, these soldiers are enlisted, assigned a rank, and begin their service. The world's airspace is the domain of all kinds of insects. This particular Air Force patrols all but the coldest regions of the globe. Carefully attending to the local flora, honeybees, Honeybees embody the idea of hive intelligence. The hive operates like a single living organism. To make it work, everyone's a specialist with a specific job to perform. A hive could have 30,000 or more crew members. Sterile female workers collect pollen to feed the colony. Male drones stay near the hive to protect it and build a new honeycomb. It's a tightly run operation, as disciplined as any military unit. But what goes on behind the scenes to keep the hive humming? These tiny pilots rely on two systems to perform their duties, pheromones that they pick up with their antennae and polarized light from the sun. The pheromones are like orders that come directly from the general, in this case, the hive's only queen. She alone lays the eggs, up to 2,000 a day. The queen's most important pheromones reassure the hive that she's okay, so they won't produce another queen. Other pheromones prevent the workers from laying eggs of their own. Her pheromones keep her in charge. They also keep the hive running smoothly so everyone knows his or her specialized role in the feeding and protection of the colony. 
Among these specialists live super specialists. Heater bees flap their wing muscles to raise the temperature in the hive. Not only do they keep the hive warm, but by controlling the temperature of the eggs, they can determine which of the workers will become foragers and which will become housekeepers. They keep crucial hive operations in balance. Every bee performs its duty perfectly because it's the job he or she was born to do. Every day, foraging worker bees fly reconnaissance missions to collect nectar and pollen. They may travel as far as 15 kilometers from the hive. Working on the front lines, they're lucky to live a month. On average, these workers will visit up to 500 million flowers in a season. They navigate by reading polarized light on sunny days and on cloudy days, ultraviolet light. But what is even more amazing is the way they convey their military intelligence to the other troops when they return to the hive. They reveal the coordinates of the pollen source by doing a waggle dance. The waggle tells the squadron the distance to the food source. The longer the waggle, the further the source. Then there's angle. It shows where the target is in relation to the sun, even when the sun moves as the day progresses. The bee's internal clock tells her the correct position. By this amazingly accurate technique, she can guide the others to food sources up to six kilometers away, ensuring the hive won't go hungry. Moving on to Africa, where the most ferocious of bees live, a hive is under siege. Elephants will tear down trees to eat the tender leaves, but this tree has a beehive. The entire colony could be wiped out. The soldiers go to DEFCON 2. Pheromones spread the alert. Everyone reports to battle stations. Every time they sting the elephant, they leave traces of pheromone that attracts more bees to the spot. That's a lot of painful stings, especially to the soft skin. The bee's swift response repels the enemy. A great victory for the small bees, using the power of scent to protect their nation. Bees use their specialist powers to build and expand, but they keep to themselves. Others use the same powers to stage huge invasions, cutting a swath of destruction in their path. The arrival of seasonal rains brings a shot of life across the landscape after a prolonged drought. This new green world can also awaken a ravenous sleeper cell. In African, American, and Australian arid zones, when conditions are right, a demolition team starts to gather, seemingly out of nowhere. They begin their long, hungry march across the grassland. They look strangely familiar. You've seen them or their relatives around, but hopefully never like this. Invading in force, here come the locusts. Swarms of desert locusts can span several hundred square kilometers. At about 50 million locusts per square kilometer, we're talking an invasion of tens of thousands of millions of voracious infantry. They navigate to the next battlefield by detecting polarized light. As they grow into adults, they molt, and each time they do, their sensory equipments and appetites improve. At this early stage in their campaign, they follow the smell of fresh, sprouting grass.
It's been said that an army marches on its stomach. That's true for locusts. Five weeks of constant eating mobilizes the infantry. Each soldier munches the equivalent of its body weight every day. Once they reach adulthood, these special forces improve their battle readiness. The locust infantry goes airborne. As winged adults, they aren't stopped by obstacles, so they can increase their destructive power. These adults release pheromones, signaling others in their swarm to join them in their search for new, fresh feeding grounds. Though desert locusts mostly use wind to travel great distances, they also read polarized sunlight. Each compound eye consists of around 9,000 optical sensors called omatidia. About 400 of them are calibrated to detect polarized light. Besides orienting the swarm, the light helps them avoid large bodies of water so they don't risk drowning. By following the wind, they always head to areas with low pressure, which means rain and fresh vegetation. They'll keep consuming crops until all that's left is the barren desert. At the end of the season, they'll die, but a new generation will arise from eggs they've laid. The conditions in which they hatch will determine whether they live solitary lives or will once again assemble an army. It seems that five senses would be enough, but nature proves over and over again that they're not. And even among some specialists, the basic five get stretched to the limit. Take barn swallows. They migrate thousands of miles by relying not on sight or sound or smell, but by sensing the planet's magnetic field above and below the equator. Bottlenose dolphins rely on hearing, but in a high-frequency, highly unconventional way. They use echolocation like sonar to find their meals and other sounds to find pod mates. Rhinos also use sound, but where dolphins hear high notes, rhinos are specialists at transmitting low infrasound like a secret message to a friendly agent. While rhinos are transmitters, stingrays are receivers. They use a sixth sense to pick up minute electrical signals from their prey. When the water's a conductor, resistance is futile. A wolf hunts more traditionally, relying on his remarkable sense of smell. To a wolf, the wilderness must be a kaleidoscope of ever-changing scents for him and his pack to explore and exploit.
Like wolves, meerkats use sight and scent, but mainly to avoid predators. And similar to wolves, they rely on teamwork. Bees live in a different world of chemical signals in the pheromones that dictate their behavior. And to navigate, these special forces trust their eyes, not with anything we can see, but by reading polarized light. It's a specialized skill bees share with locusts. When these field workers unite and revolt, cutting a swath across the land, polarized light steers them clear of wide water. These are the specialists, the special forces who have mastered their particular place in the world. Más rápida que cualquier infantería, superando a los marines. La Fuerza Aérea tiene el campo de batalla cubierto, sin importar cuán duro sea el territorio. Al tomar los cielos con sus sentidos afinados, estos aviadores rápidos y audaces tienen lo que se necesita. Cuando se trata de obtener una ventaja aérea, el cielo es el límite para estas fuerzas especiales. Supersentidos 2. Fuerzas especiales. Fuerzas aéreas. Australia. Hábitat del águila audaz. Una vista panorámica es todo lo que este aviador necesita para realizar sus maniobras de precisión. Agregue algunas rocas para que sirvan de plataforma de lanzamiento y de observación, y este asesino aerotransportado comienza a trabajar. Opera libremente en la mayor parte del paisaje australiano, aunque prefiere los espacios abiertos a las áreas boscosas que podrían frustrar su misión. El ave de presa más grande de Australia explora lo que sea que se mueva bajo su percha y apunta cuidadosamente a quien morirá. Este ángel de la muerte es el águila audaz. No se le llama ojo de águila por nada. Su visión es hasta ocho veces más aguda que la nuestra y con ella localiza a su presa. Una vez enfocado en su presa, se eleva por el aire, sin perder de vista a su objetivo. En el momento en que ve su oportunidad, golpea con sus enormes garras. Un águila puede ver un conejo desde más de 3 kilómetros de distancia. Sus ojos de fuerzas especiales casi no tienen comparación entre los vertebrados. Aunque un águila solo pesa alrededor de 4,5 kilogramos, sus ojos son aproximadamente del mismo tamaño que los nuestros. Por supuesto, estos instrumentos de precisión necesitan un mantenimiento regular. Están provistos de una membrana nictitante, un tercer párpado interior que limpia el ojo cada 3 o 4 segundos para eliminar la suciedad y las bacterias. Esta también protege el ojo durante el vuelo y mientras se lanzan en el aire. La membrana es traslúcida, por lo que el piloto puede ver a través de ella cuando está cerrada. Este comando de élite espía un conejo. A medida que se lanza desde el cielo para atacar a su presa, los músculos de sus ojos ajustan continuamente la curvatura de la lente. Estos microajustes mantienen un enfoque nítido y una percepción precisa durante todo el enfoque y el ataque. Y eso es muy malo para el conejo. Las dos fobias o centros de enfoque del águila permiten que el ave mire hacia adelante y hacia un lado al mismo tiempo. Sus globos oculares más pesados que su cerebro se mueven por separado, pero son demasiado grandes para girar mucho en su órbita. 
Una estructura del ojo llamada peine puede ayudar a nutrirlo, percibir el movimiento, proteger al sol y detectar campos magnéticos. En América del Norte vive otro aviador de las fuerzas especiales, la patriótica Águila Calva. Este majestuoso símbolo de Estados Unidos con una envergadura de hasta 2,5 metros patrulla principalmente cerca de grandes masas de agua buscando peces. Estas fuerzas especiales pueden deslizarse hasta 100 metros sobre la superficie del agua. y Sin embargo, sus ojos pueden ver peces que estén debajo de esta. Esa es una hazaña extraordinaria, ya que la mayoría de los peces tienen sombra contraria que los camufla contra los ataques aéreos. Pero estos notables ojos de alta tecnología registran alrededor de 150 imágenes por segundo. Lo que vemos como un movimiento continuo, el águila lo registra como una serie de imágenes lentas, lo que le da tiempo suficiente para enfocarse en un objetivo. Misión cumplida para el majestuoso cazador. Estos guerreros aéreos de fuerzas especiales se hacen, no nacen. Las águilas jóvenes no pueden ver debajo del agua hasta que hayan crecido un poco más. Un águila sin vista es como un avión sin motor. Su vida y su sustento dependen de que se mantenga en buenas condiciones de trabajo. Afortunadamente, estos guerreros aéreos no parecen estar sujetos a problemas comunes como la miopía o hipermetropía que otras criaturas pueden sufrir. En resumen, con su visión superior, las fuerzas especiales águila dominan los espacios aéreos en los que habitan. Para nuestra próxima fuerza aérea no tenemos que viajar lejos de los sitios donde anida el águila calva. Esta flota es famosa no por su ferocidad, sino por su resistencia. Su plan de vuelo cubre la mayor parte de América del Norte durante los meses de verano, pero tienden a aterrizar en una ubicación muy específica del sur en el invierno. la mariposa monarca. Estos graciosos aviadores naranja y negro con una envergadura de 10 centímetros decoran el cielo. Su migración anual precisa y épica es única entre los insectos. Su piloto automático para su viaje de más de 4.000 kilómetros se traba sobre el campo magnético de la Tierra y lee la luz ultravioleta a través de sus antenas especializadas. Pero antes de que puedan ganar sus alas, deben nacer varias veces. Como larvas cadetes se les llama orugas y comen hojas de algodoncillo tóxico. Son voraces devoradoras. Cada una es capaz de consumir una hoja entera de algodoncillo en menos de cinco minutos. Cada oruga tiene la misión de ganar 2.700 veces su peso original. Esto los prepara para la próxima etapa de su entrenamiento. Cuando han comido hasta saciarse, se adaptan y se convierten en crisálidas. Y ese es su paso final antes de convertirse en mariposas de fuerzas especiales completamente desarrolladas y certificadas para el vuelo. 
y eso les otorga un privilegio especial, el derecho de aparearse. Esta no se apareará aquí y ahora. En su lugar se embarcará en su misión migratoria y esperará la primavera. Ella no tiene elección. Cuando llega el otoño, las plantas de algodoncillo crecen en poca cantidad y pierden su nutrición. Además, el frío puede matarla. Entonces ella seguirá el calor. La fuerza aérea de la mariposa monarca se cuenta en millones mientras trazan su rumbo hacia el soleado México. Nunca necesitan un plan de vuelo. Sus antenas multiuso son todo lo que necesitan para orientarse. Partes de la antena son sensibles al olor de sus compañeros pilotos para la comunicación durante el vuelo. Otras áreas sensibles a la luz se rastrean el sol, mientras que otras perciben la temperatura, la dirección del viento y el campo magnético del planeta. Toda esta instrumentación trabaja en conjunto para ayudar a estas fuerzas especiales a sortear los peligros y encontrar su destino sin problemas. Durante cinco meses en México, las mariposas monarca permanecen en tierra disfrutando de un merecido descanso. De noviembre a enero se reunirán y no moverán un músculo. Viven de la grasa almacenada que obtienen antes de comenzar la migración. A mediados de febrero, cuando el clima comienza a calentarse, las mariposas apiñadas comienzan a separarse y buscar néctar. Por fin es primavera y comienza la misión de aparearse. Será su misión final. Las mariposas mueren después de eso, pero la próxima generación de reclutas es la que lleva a cabo la orden de regresar al norte. Es una maniobra complicada. Tres generaciones hacen un viaje de ida, la cuarta completa el viaje de ida y vuelta. El noviazgo de la mariposa monarca puede durar 16 horas o más. Se aparean solo al final. Agotadas de su viaje y del acto en sí, estos adultos mueren. Sus vidas duraron de seis a ocho meses. En unas pocas semanas, las orugas obtendrán sus trajes de vuelo para gobernar los cielos. Para el momento en que la cuarta generación de mariposas se regresa al norte, el algodoncillo se ha repuesto y éstas pueden volver a engordar. Solo las mariposas monarcas realizan esta misteriosa migración de varias generaciones, gracias a su infalible sistema de guía magnética a bordo. En el otro lado del mundo está una fuerza aérea con un alcance más corto, pero con misiones mucho más frecuentes. Las junglas australianas son el hogar de un escuadrón de pilotos especializados. Se trata de los murciélagos de la fruta. Como su nombre indica, esta raza de murciélagos más grande se alimenta de jugos de fruta fresca en vez de cazar insectos. Prefieren volar al atardecer. Cuando el sol comienza a ponerse, encienden sus motores. Todas las noches viajan desde sus refugios a sus lugares de alimentación y de regreso. Navegan guiándose por el olfato para misiones de largo alcance y por la visión cuando el viaje es de más corto alcance.
El murciélago de la fruta tiene la visión más aguda de todas las especies de murciélagos. Al combinar la vista y el olfato pueden ubicar los alimentos y volar sin peligro. Por la mañana el escuadrón regresa a su hangar. En este alboroto es difícil encontrar compañeros de vuelo. Las madres llaman a sus crías y esperan una respuesta. A diferencia de los murciélagos cazadores de insectos, los frugívoros no usan la ecolocación. Producen aproximadamente 20 sonidos diferentes y dejan marcas de olor para que sus compañeros de escuadrón sepan dónde han estado y qué están haciendo. Sus ojos funcionan muy bien tanto de día como de noche. Al dormir en grupos a la luz del día son más aptos para detectar a un depredador y hacer sonar la alarma. Su mayor enemigo, el águila marina de vientre blanco, realizará un ataque aéreo contra cualquier murciélago que no haya alcanzado la seguridad del hangar. El alboroto del escuadrón de murciélagos confunde el sistema de guía visual del águila marina. Él no sabe dónde atacar y aborta su misión. Pero es un adversario muy paciente y esperará su momento hasta que vea un murciélago frugal detrás del resto. Los murciélagos cuelgan de las ramas hasta que el caliente sol comienza a ponerse y sus depredadores se dirigen a sus camas. Los murciélagos frugívoros pueden posarse hasta 60 kilómetros de sus áreas de alimentación. Sin ecolocación, los murciélagos dependen de sus ojos en la oscuridad del crepúsculo. Al igual que muchos animales nocturnos, los ojos del murciélago frugívoro contienen una capa reflectante llamada tapetum lucidum que aprovecha al máximo la luz entrante. Pero la del murciélago de la fruta es aún más avanzada y se encuentra más comúnmente en ciertos peces, cocodrilos y marsupiales. La Fuerza Aérea ha alcanzado su objetivo designado. Los murciélagos pasarán toda la noche comiendo. Los murciélagos aplastan la fruta con sus dientes de romos y chupan el jugo y la pulpa blanda. Mientras mastican, escupen las semillas y en el proceso plantan nuevos árboles. Sus trajes de vuelo peludos recogen granos de polen, que los murciélagos esparcen de forma involuntaria durante sus rondas de recolección de fruta. Así, los murciélagos frugívoros realizan la misión pacífica como fuerzas especiales polinizadores nocturnos. Cuando terminen, volverán a sus nidos y descansarán antes de su misión siguiente. Nuestro próximo experto en aviación es un rastreador de fuerzas especiales. Sus habilidades de fuerza aérea son altamente efectivas y cumple tareas cruciales. Es una parte indispensable de su hábitat, pero como soldado sufre de una mala reputación que no merece. Los miembros de esta fuerza aérea son un equipo de limpieza de clase mundial que habita la mayor parte del tiempo, el así llamado Nuevo Mundo. En las playas de Costa Rica, las tortugas golfinas se reúnen para poner sus huevos. Mientras que este evento es una invitación abierta para los depredadores, 
Esta fuerza aérea tiene una misión diferente en mente. Se trata de los buitres negros. La mayoría de las tortugas están agotadas después de su viaje y algunas no sobreviven. Para eso vinieron los buitres. Limpiarán el cadáver hasta dejar solo huesos. Estos enterradores del mundo animal libran a la playa de carne en descomposición y previenen la propagación de enfermedades. Para ubicar su comida usan sus fosas nasales. Los buitres negros y sus parientes, los buitres de Turquía, suelen ser los primeros en responder a la muerte. Su sentido del olfato les da una fuerte ventaja sobre otros carroñeros. Los buitres negros escanean el área debajo de ellos desde unos 300 metros. Esta fuerza aérea patrulla las playas donde la vegetación es escasa y complementa la detección de olores con una vista de pájaro. Pero la carroña no es lo único que está en el menú. Las crías de tortuga se convierten en una comida fácil y animada para los buitres negros. Ellos saben que las mismas playas donde las tortugas ponen huevos pronto producirán miles de crías indefensas. Es algo en lo que siempre pueden confiar, tan inevitable como la muerte. Solo unas pocas tortugas logran escapar de estos depredadores. Por otro lado, los buitres de Turquía prefieren áreas boscosas y nunca tocan carne viva. En patrulla, deslizándose en las corrientes térmicas, esta fuerza aérea rastrea trazas de olores provenientes de animales en descomposición. Dando vueltas con el aroma como meta, moviéndose más cerca a medida que se vuelve más fuerte, hasta que encuentran la fuente. Hoy es una misión fácil. Hay un cadáver de venado a la intemperie. Pero su sentido del olfato es tan agudo y el olor de la muerte tan distintivo que pueden encontrar una comida tan pequeña como un roedor muerto enterrado debajo de un montón de hojas. El buitre de Turquía patrulla a unos 30 metros sobre el suelo mientras busca comida. Se acerca al olor del etilmercaptano, un gas que se produce cuando la carne comienza a descomponerse. Probablemente pueda discernirlo en concentraciones tan diluidas como unas pocas partes por cada mil millones. Las fosas nasales y el bulbo olfatorio del buitre de Turquía son más grandes que las del buitre negro. Estas diferencias anatómicas dan a los buitres de Turquía una ventaja sobre los buitres negros con quienes podrían competir. Pero los buitres negros son más fuertes. El escuadrón de buitres de Turquía podría llegar primero a la escena, pero deben comer rápido o correr el riesgo de ser expulsados. Aunque prácticamente cualquier cosa muerta es un blanco apropiado para ellos, los buitres prefieren mamíferos a recién muertos, si se les da la opción. Sostienen el cadáver con sus garras romas mientras sus agudos picos lo desgarran. Sus cabezas calvas no tienen plumas que se ensucien cuando pegan sus cabezas dentro del cadáver. Los buitres no podrían realizar su trabajo de fuerzas especiales sin un sistema inmune fuerte. Parecen ser resistentes a la mayoría de las enfermedades transmitidas por los alimentos como el antrax y el cólera, y al consumir carne podrida evitan que las enfermedades se propaguen. Los buitres son una fuerza aérea que prospera con el aire viciado. 
son el equipo de limpieza no respetado, pero indispensable. Mientras estamos en el nuevo mundo, estamos reclutando un piloto de fuerzas especiales con asombrosas habilidades aéreas acrobáticas. Un piloto que puede planear como un helicóptero de combate. Los miembros de esta pequeña pero formidable fuerza aérea aviar son nativos de las Américas. Son los colibríes. Las aves más pequeñas del planeta tienen un promedio de 10 centímetros de longitud. La más pequeña de ellas tiene solo la mitad de ese tamaño. La misión de este pájaro, recolectar dulce néctar dentro de las flores. Sus diminutas y poderosas alas que aletean hasta 50 veces por segundo producen un zumbido. Las alas le permiten planear, volar hacia atrás y alcanzar velocidades de hasta 50 kilómetros por hora. El cerebro de un colibrí es aproximadamente el 4% de su peso corporal, el tamaño más grande de cerebro en relación con el cuerpo en el reino de las aves. Muchos de esos recursos mentales están dedicados a la visión, el sentido más importante del colibrí. Debido a que un colibrí es un as aéreo capaz de cambiar su trayectoria de vuelo en un instante, necesita buena vista para evitar colisiones en el aire y también para perseguir insectos pequeños. Debe comer el equivalente a aproximadamente 3.000 moscas de la fruta al día. Aunque su cerebro es demasiado grande para un pájaro tan pequeño, los ojos de un colibrí pesan más que su cerebro. En comparación, nuestro cerebro es casi 100 veces más pesado que nuestros ojos. Aunque los colibríes tienen ojos pequeños en comparación con nosotros, tienen muchas más células fotorreceptoras, lo que les ayuda a ver mejor. También pueden ver la luz ultravioleta. Sus trajes de vuelo iridiscentes y de colores del arco iris sugieren que el color juega un papel crucial en sus vidas. En su mayoría parece que dependen del color y los rayos ultravioleta para atraer y seleccionar parejas potenciales, pero principalmente sus ojos son herramientas de navegación fundamentales. Los ojos del colibrí están calibrados para volar. Están posicionados para maximizar la visión binocular 3D hacia adelante y la visión monocular en los lados y hacia arriba y hacia abajo. Dependiendo de lo que vean y dónde lo vean, pueden hacer correcciones de curso en vuelo instantáneas para evitar el peligro o encontrar esa flor dulce. Además de los párpados regulares, tienen una membrana nictitante clara que cubre sus ojos como gafas de vuelo a medida que el pájaro acelera a través del aire. Con sus ojos agudos y su visión del color, se pensaría que el color es lo que usan para seleccionar las flores. Bueno, eso sería una equivocación. A pesar de su habilidad para ver el color, estos insignificantes pilotos no dependen mucho de él. Al organizar un ataque aéreo en una flor llena de néctar, están más preocupados por la ubicación de la flor que por su color. Una vez que encuentran flores que son más dulces o que producen néctar más rápido, notan la ubicación y regresan a esas flores independientemente del color. En su vuelo de alta velocidad, los colibríes miden la distancia al observar la cantidad de objetos que se agrandan al acercarse. Ello requiere un procesamiento mental rápido y no es la forma en la que muchos otros animales perciben la distancia.
Todo sobre el sistema de guía visual de la Fuerza Aérea Colibrí está orientado a permitir a las aves alcanzar la velocidad máxima sin colisionar con nada a su alrededor. De manera proporcional, los colibríes son los vertebrados más rápidos y que se pueden manejar mejor en el mundo. Su pequeño tamaño les convierte en presas potenciales de cualquier animal, desde ranas y búhos hasta gatos domésticos, pero sus habilidades de aviadores de primera categoría los hace difíciles de atrapar. Sin embargo, una cosa que no pueden superar es la pérdida de hábitat. Hasta ahora hemos visto águilas de combate, grandes aviadoras monárquicas de largo alcance, sorprendentes rastreadores de buitres e incluso colibríes como helicópteros de nuestra Brigada Aérea de Fuerzas Especiales. Ahora revisaremos las habilidades de un especialista en misiles que opera en las costas de la mayoría de los continentes. Esta Fuerza Aérea vive en enormes colonias como esta en Muriwai, Nueva Zelanda. Esta roca en la costa ennegrecida está salpicada por nidos que pertenecen a los alcatraces. Gran cantidad de estos pájaros viven en las costas en colonias altamente organizadas donde cuidan de sus crías. Cada día comienza una nueva misión sobre el mar. Se despliegan para buscar provisiones, peces para alimentarse, pero también para regurgitar y alimentar a los cadetes que no han comenzado el entrenamiento de vuelo. Su vista altamente especializada ayuda a hacer el trabajo. El sistema visual de los alcatraces les permite ver a sus presas a cierta distancia desde el aire y de manera tan aguda cuando se sumergen a alta velocidad en el agua. Esa capacidad de cambiar el enfoque entre el aire y el agua es su arma secreta. Ayuda a clasificar a la Fuerza Aérea de Alcatraces como una de las más exitosas en el mar, con un promedio de 72% de muertes por ave. Los ojos orientados hacia adelante del Alcatraz dan al aviador visión binocular para evaluar con precisión las distancias. Estos aviadores rara vez vuelan misiones en solitario. Como las aves sociales, funcionan mejor como un escuadrón. Este escuadrón ha encontrado lo que estaba buscando, un banco de sardinas. Un alcatraz se enfoca en su objetivo desde 30 metros sobre el nivel del mar y se sumerge. Desde esa altura, un alcatraz alcanza una velocidad de hasta 100 kilómetros por hora antes de tocar el agua. Al contacto con el agua, sus lentes cambian de forma esférica a ovalada. El cambio focal lleva solo 80 milisegundos, el más rápido de cualquier pájaro. Desde el aire hasta el agua nunca pierden de vista a su presa. Su caída de alta velocidad los envía a una profundidad de 20 metros por debajo de la superficie, lo que les da una ventaja sobre otras aves de pesca. En las aguas de África, un escuadrón de alcatraces se ocupa de su comida. Además de las gafas de vuelo personalizadas, el traje de vuelo de un alcatraz viene equipado con características de seguridad. En primer lugar, los alcatraces no tienen fosas nasales externas. En cambio, están ocultas dentro del pico para evitar que entre agua en ellas.
En segundo lugar, los sacos de aire debajo de la piel en el cuello y el baúl amortiguan el impacto a alta velocidad del ave con el agua. Esta es una fuerza aérea trabajadora. Un alcatraz adulto pesa alrededor de 3,5 kilogramos, pero debe entregar alrededor de 2,5 kilogramos de pescado a cada polluelo todos los días. Los vencedores regresan a su aeródromo, una base de operaciones que puede estar a 400 kilómetros del lugar de casa. Donde quiera que les lleve su misión, los alcatraces siempre están listos para la acción. No es de extrañar que estos bombarderos voladores veloces y de enfoque nítido tengan éxito en sus estaciones aéreas navales en todo el mundo. Yendo hacia el interior desde los alados mares, encontramos a nuestra próxima fuerza aérea patrullando estanques de agua dulce, ríos y pantanos. Estas fuerzas especiales pueden estar entre los aviadores más antiguos del planeta. Apostados en todo el mundo, con excepción de las regiones más frías, estos expertos veteranos del aire representan una de las mejores historias de éxito aéreo en todos los tiempos. Las libélulas. Las libélulas con sus parientes cercanos, los caballitos del diablo, son las mejores armas del reino animal. Tienen éxito en el 95% de sus intentos de caza. Gran parte de su habilidad se la deben a sus ojos compuestos, que todo lo ven, lo que les permite ver todas las direcciones al mismo tiempo. Además de sus alas, que les dan velocidades de hasta 30 kilómetros por hora. Y al igual que el colibrí, sus habilidades de vuelo incluyen el vuelo estacionario e incluso el volar hacia atrás. Los ojos compuestos de la libélula cubren la mayor parte de su cabeza. Cada ojo entre los más grandes de cualquier insecto contiene hasta 30.000 facetas ópticas u omatidios que perciben imágenes. Las libélulas del crepúsculo tienen menos de estas facetas. No pueden ver el color tampoco, pero son más sensibles a la luz y la sombra, lo cual es esencial para su misión. La libélula puede ver el cielo crepuscular como un fondo brillante, e incluso una pequeña presa que vuele al contrario de ella se mostraría claramente y la libélula lo podría perseguir. Pequeños movimientos y pequeñas siluetas conforman el objetivo de la libélula. Y debido a que su presa también vuela rápido, el sistema óptico de la libélula procesa la entrada visual en menos de 5 centésimas de segundo. Comparado con nosotros, el mundo se mueve mucho más rápido para una libélula. Donde el ojo humano puede decodificar 60 imágenes por segundo, eso sería cámara lenta para una libélula. Pueden procesar unos increíbles 300 cuadros por segundo. Una libélula detecta diferentes tipos de luz con diferentes partes de sus ojos compuestos. El ojo que mira hacia arriba ve longitudes de onda corta, como la luz azul y la luz ultravioleta. La parte inferior del ojo ve una longitud de onda más larga, verde y naranja. Su enfoque nítido solo se encuentra en la parte frontal. Los lados son más adecuados para captar el movimiento.
Aunque tenemos tres tipos de proteínas sensibles a la luz en los ojos que nos permiten ver el color, usando combinaciones de rojo, verde y azul, las libélulas tienen entre 11 y 30 de estas proteínas. Esta libélula emperador vio una mosca, se enfoca en ella y la persigue. Misión lograda. Prácticamente nada escapa de su mirada. Una libélula puede comer hasta 100 mosquitos por día. Cuando el cielo está despejado, la misión tiene luz verde. La Fuerza Aérea Libélula ha tenido tiempo de sobra para perfeccionar sus habilidades. Las libélulas fueron algunos de los primeros insectos alados en evolucionar hace unos 300 millones de años y se convirtieron en maestros de miniatura de los cielos. Para revisar nuestra fuerza aérea final, viajamos a los altos lagos africanos donde se reúnen sus fuerzas especiales. Los lagos Bogoria y Natron, aunque son tóxicos para la mayoría de seres vivientes, atrae a miles de estas aves. Están disfrutando de las algas de aguas termales locales y son los flamencos menores. Una espectacular reunión de hasta un millón y medio vienen aquí para encontrar parejas. Las algas le dan a su plumaje su color característico. Y la forma en que comen las algas le da aún más distinción. Estas aves no dependen de la fuerza, sino de un delicado sentido del tacto. Todo comienza con sus picos especializados que les permiten filtrar las algas nutritivas del agua tóxica. Con sus picos sensibles al tacto siempre saben exactamente lo que están devorando. Mientras comen, sus ojos proporcionan una advertencia temprana contra los depredadores. De esa manera pueden llenar sus barrigas de forma segura con los 60 gramos de alimento que necesitan. La extraña forma del pico ayuda a que funcione como un filtro sofisticado. A diferencia de otras aves, la parte superior del pico de un flamenco es más delgado que el inferior. Y a diferencia de la mayoría de los mamíferos y las aves, su mandíbula superior se mueve mientras que la inferior permanece en su lugar. Para comer mantienen la cabeza boca abajo en aguas poco profundas y se desplazan de lado a lado. Sus picos están alineados con hileras de láminas, cubiertos con pequeños pelos a través de los cuales sacan la comida del agua. Su lengua de pistón bombea agua dentro y fuera del pico de 5 a 6 veces por segundo. Las espinas curvadas hacia atrás en la lengua ayudan a guiar la comida hacia la garganta. Para afinar el sistema, los sensores nerviosos, llamados corpúsculos de Herbs, debajo de la punta superior e inferior, aseguran que solo la comida baja por el esófago y no la arena ni nada incomible. Usan su mandíbula superior para manipular alimentos más grandes, como crustáceos pequeños. Este asombroso sistema de filtración controlada por el tacto les brinda una gran ventaja y les da acceso a una generosa área de alimentación que ningún otro animal puede explotar.
pero los flamencos que se alimentan corren el peligro de convertirse ellos mismos en alimento. Para ayudar a evitar eso, los flamencos dependen principalmente de su cantidad. Al mantenerse juntos, hay menos posibilidades de que el depredador atrape a un ave en particular. A nivel individual, cada flamenco tiene una gran visión, por lo que hay muchos ojos mirando peligro. Sus ojos contienen una estructura que crea una línea de visión nítida que los ayuda a detectar depredadores a distancia. Incluso cuando los flamencos están comiendo con la cabeza boca abajo, se aseguran de vigilar su entorno. En esta posición pueden ver un panorama de casi 360 grados y pasar por alto el horizonte. Es por esto que están vigilando. El águila pescadora ataca. Pero los flamencos saben de ella. La fuerza aérea del flamenco se eleva como una gran nube rosada. El águila tendrá que intentarlo otra vez. Cuando se trata de tácticas de supervivencia, una rama de las fuerzas especiales se eleva por encima del resto. Se trata de las fuerzas aéreas. Las águilas confían en su aguda visión para sus operaciones de vigilancia. Su vista ocho veces más aguda que la nuestra puede penetrar el agua. La estructura de su hoja le da una excelente percepción adelante y periféricamente. El viaje épico de las mariposas monarcas no se basa en la vista, sino en su capacidad de sentir el magnetismo. Navegan sin problemas a su destino sin haber estado allí antes. Como las mariposas monarcas, los murciélagos frugívoros vuelan en escuadrones. Confían en la vista y el olfato para evitar a los depredadores y encontrar comida, lo que hacen en la oscuridad gracias a su tejido ocular altamente reflectante. Mientras los murciélagos realizan misiones para encontrar fruta jugosa, nada hace que se haga más agua a la boca del buitre que un cadáver fresco. Para encontrarlo siguen el olor gracias a un bulbo olfatorio agrandado. El olor de la muerte los atrae en su misión. Un colibrí persigue algo mucho más dulce y recorre los lechos de flores en busca de néctar. Sus ojos pesan más que su cerebro y necesita que el cerebro mida qué tan rápido está volando en su misión de alcanzar sus flores favoritas. El Alcatraz también confía en la visión, ya que los escuadrones de ellos realizan misiones de bombarderos de inmersión sobre el mar abierto y hasta como 20 metros de profundidad bajo la superficie. Sus lentes que se enfocan rápidamente aseguran una operación exitosa. En el agua dulce, una de las fuerzas aéreas más antiguas del planeta persigue a los insectos que se mueven rápidamente. El sistema visual de ultra alta velocidad de la libélula le permite dibujar un cordón en un insecto más rápido que un parpadeo. Los flamencos adoptan un enfoque táctil más relajado. Este escuadrón rosa aterriza en lagos repletos de algas y utiliza picos sensibles para filtrar pequeñas presas del agua. Aunque se alimentan al revés, los flamencos siempre mantienen sus ojos bien abiertos para los depredadores. Estas son las fuerzas especiales que controlan el cielo, ya sea que estén patrullando, en la casa o simplemente yendo de un lugar a otro. Estas fuerzas aéreas emplean una variedad de habilidades tácticas y maniobras especializadas para cumplir sus misiones diarias.